let's begin. We're going to have a tough time living up to this room, I think. <laughs> and also the title of our session, Secrets of the Stacks. But we hope we'll give you some secrets. And they're not secret enough so you can leave this room and tell your friends about them. <laughs> uh, let me just start off by saying that uh, uh, after the session, and we'd like you to file out as soon as you can because there'll be another session after this one, uh, books will be available from some of our panelists uh, at the Greenlight Bookstore outside on the plaza, and some of the panelists will be signing books down in the rotunda of this building of Borough Hall. Uh, also, Secrets of the Stacks is presented by Bloomberg Connects, the app that all of you can download, uh, an app that gives you access to many of the cultural institutions of this city, including lots of archives that you may not be able to visit directly or have time to visit, but are available online. Now, I'm a reporter for the New York Times, Sam Roberts, and I could tell you that archivists, curators, librarians are the only ones who I deal with who give me information with pleasure. Uh, most of the other people I deal with say, no, uh, this is the stuff you can't have. But when I go to archivists, they welcome my questions. They sit around with this trove of information and nobody asks for it. Uh, and it is such a pleasure to go to people like this who have all of this information available to them, keep accumulating more of it all the time and their job, their mission in society is to get it out there. And when someone like me or this professional historian comes along, they welcome the opportunity to disseminate it. That is their job. And I am so thankful that these people are around. And you know, I just congratulate them and welcome that opportunity. For historians, for amateur historians, for journalists, when you talk about going into the field, you know, what do you do when you go into the field as a historian? You go to the archives. Uh, you can't go back into history, at least not yet. Uh, so you're going into the archives when you do that. And Carl Sagan once said uh, that we are the only species, at least that we know of, uh, that has invented a communal memory. Uh, we, we store that not in our genes, not in our brains, but in a library, in a library or in an archive. Uh, there's nowhere else to do that. Uh, and uh, Anthony Beaver, the uh, author and historian said, I get slightly obsessive about working in archives because you don't know what you're going to find. You don't know what you're looking for until you find it. And that's what's so much fun about working in archives. I've done a number of books. I've certainly done a lot of stories. And what's so exciting about looking in archives is the joy, the surprise of finding things. And that's what secrets of the archives are all about. You don't know what's there. Uh, you may go in saying, I want to find this particular fact, this date, this anecdote, this whatever, but you never know what you're going to discover. And that's what makes the archives so exciting. And frankly, nowadays, I'm writing obituaries for the Times. And what makes the archives so exciting now, I feel like I'm cheating because I remember when I started out, so much of this stuff was not available. It existed somewhere, but now digitally, there are oral histories, there are biographies, there are interviews, there are uh, videos uh, that were not available then. When I started out at the Daily News, I won't tell you how long ago, if I wanted to get a phone number of someone in another city, I had to go to the public library and look it up in a <laughs> phone book. Now, obviously, you don't have to do that. So I have to tell you, I feel a little guilty these days when I do research. 
but I overcome that hill. Uh, <laughs> and I don't want to say it's too easy, but it's a lot easier than it used to be. And I, I envy the people who do research today because it is so much easier than it used to be, and they should be grateful to the resources that are available today and to the people like these archivists who assemble those resources and uh, make them available to people like you. I'm gonna introduce these archivists briefly. They are gonna tell you a little bit about what's in their collections and show you a little bit uh, in slides. And then I'm gonna ask them some questions about how they collect, what they collect, how it becomes available, why it's important, and then I'm gonna leave a little bit of time at the end so you could ask some questions too, and then we're gonna finish by 10 minutes to uh, two. So Rhonda Evans, director of the Lou Esther Mertz Library at the New York Botanical Garden, it's the largest botanical research library in the United States. Before joining the library there, she served as assistant chief librarian at the Schomburg Center Research in Black Culture of the New York Public Library in Harlem. She's written for multiple publications and also has taught at Pratt Institute. Dr. John O'Neill, curator of rare books and manuscripts at the Hispanic Society of America, that's in Upper Manhattan. He oversees the largest collection of Spanish rare books outside of Spain and Latin America. He received a PhD in Hispanic philology from the University of Wisconsin in Madison uh, in 1997. In 1996, he joined the Hispanic Society as the curator of manuscripts and rare books. And Ricky Riccardi, director of research collections at the Louis Armstrong House Museum in Queens. He's author of What a Wonderful World, The Magic of Louis Armstrong's Later Years and The Heart Full of Rhythm, The Big Band Years of Louis Armstrong. In 2022, he won a Grammy Award for Best Album Notes for the Complete Louis <laughs> Armstrong Columbia and RCA Studio Sessions, 1946 to 1966. Now, a very distinguished panel. You've heard enough from me. Let's uh, hear from Rhonda about what's in her great collection. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope if I, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So I'm so excited to be here today to talk to you all about the library at the New York Botanical Garden. Uh, just uh, by way of introduction, again, my name is Rhonda Evans. I'm the director of the Lou Esther T. Mertz Library. I'm the brand new director. I've been there for about three months, <laughs> and I'm really excited to be there. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> so on the uh, first slide here, that's the library. So if any of you have been to the New York Botanical Garden and seen that beautiful building and wonder, what is that? That is the library. And so we are the largest botanical library in the United States. We started in 1899, and we're probably the largest botanical library in the world. So what does that mean to be a botanical library? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the idea about the scope of what we have. And I'm gonna talk about some of our collections through the slides here, but first, I want to let you know, when you say botanical library, that means anything related to plants. So that's botany, that's horticulture, that's garden and landscape design, uh, greenhouse design. So anything that's related to plants. So it sounds really like a narrow focus, but when you think about your, your everyday life, the food that you eat, the, um, the clothes that you're wearing, your own garden, the homeopathic remedies that might have been passed down through generations. That's all related to plants. So it sounds like a small scope, but it's really, really quite large. And so I'm gonna talk about a, a couple of items to give you an idea of what's in our collections. So first, uh, it's a little difficult to see here, but you're looking at some maps. So one of our collections is what's called special collections. And so that's a, a collection of many different items, including ephemera, it includes materials like antique microscopes, even insects, 
And what you're seeing here are maps. And the map on the bottom is from 1860. And it's a map documenting Central Park as it's being built, as it's being developed. And so we're not just collecting botanical uh, uh, and landscape design information for the world, but also really focusing on the history of the green spaces that you experience in New York City. So if you're interested on how, what was the process like for Central Park being developed, the map is a great example. So that's just one part of our special collection. We also have, I would argue, the largest uh, botanical rare book collection in the world. We have over 20,000 rare books and folios that document 10 centuries of information. So this is our oldest uh, book from 1190. This is one of the first books to kind of document the attempts of Western pharmacology, and it was created by monks uh, in Salerno, Italy. So we have a wonderful collection of rare books uh, documenting all areas of plant, botany, herbalism, pharmacology, and garden design. We have a wonderful archive. So this is a letter to the famous botanist John Torrey. One thing that people don't realize about the New York Botanical Garden is that we have a really strong science arm. We are the home to the International Plant Science Center. And so we have always had scientists on staff and working in the field. And we have a lot of archives that document the work that they have been doing um, for the past century working with the garden. And so this is this letter uh, asking about, um, I believe, certain plant names for, to John Torrey. It's just one example of what's in our archive. And this is, uh, this is another uh, book from our rare book collection. But one of the things that you'll see in it is that it also has um, some, some images. So we have a really wonderful collection of, of botanical images and art that you can uh, exhibit, that you can see. And that's another one. OK, this is a wonderful book. So when we talk about kind of rare books and special collections, we're not just looking backwards, right? The New York Botanical Garden is also looking forward, and we're also looking towards our community. So this is a wonderful limited edition artist book called A Glass House by Bronx-based artist Sarah Nichols. And this, she used some of our uh, uh, architectural designs for her book. It's uh, beautifully created. Uh, some of the paper is almost like glass. You can see through it. And this has been added to our rare book collection. So we're not just talking about what's happening in the past. We're looking towards our community and talking about what's going on in the future. And so I put this here. This is a, a children during our story time. And what a lot of people don't know is that we have like a circulating collection, like you would experience at a public library. It has popular books. It has fiction, children's books, YA, magazines, that if you are a member of the garden or a member of the Bronx community, you can get a card and you can check out, or anyone can just come and use these materials uh, for anything that you're interested in, even fiction related to, to plants. And I think that uh, it is all that I have. But I do want to just add that we have over 770,000 volumes in our library, covering everything from scientific journals to, again, children's books. So we even have a plant information center. So if any questions that you might have about your garden, your house plant, your trees, your, your parks, you can write us and you can ask us those questions. The fall is a beautiful time to visit the New York Botanical Garden. So we hope that you will come. And when you're visiting the garden, and you're walking through the Thane Family Forest, that you will also come and visit us at the library. Thank, Thank you. you. Brenda. And I apologize today that we can't have class out on the quad on such a beautiful day. This day, it's not raining of all days. Uh, John O'Neill, what's at the Hispanic Society? Uh, what's not at the Hispanic Society, <laughs> pertaining to Hispanic and, and uh, Portuguese cultures. Uh, first, let me just say that thank you, Sam, for the introduction. I know my accent probably isn't the one that most people were expecting, uh, <laughs> but hopefully the success of Dairy Girls has uh, at least trained some people in my <laughs> mode of uh, pronunci pronunciation and intonation. So the Hispanic Society, first of all, where is it? It's at, uh, on Broadway between 155th and 156th Street. Uh, easily reachable on the one line. Stop, the stop is at 157th Street. You just walk back one block, and it is free. It is free entrance, uh, and it is well worth the visit. I think the first image we have is the facade of the, of the building, and you can see in the reflection of, of, the, of the glass door, 
uh, you can see the statue of El, El Cid, which was done by the founder. His wife was a sculptress, Anna Hyatt Huntington, and she did the statue of, the, of, uh, of the El Cid. She also did the Joan of Arc, which is on uh, Riverside Drive. She also did the Jose Marti, I think, which is in Central Park. So she's a noted sculptress. Uh, the next image is it's of the gallery, the principal gallery, as it is at the moment with the exhibition that you can see for free if you were to go there, which, which you, if, when you go there, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see there's a Goya, Velázquez, uh, various paintings. You can see the famous Duchess of Alba painting in the, in the background there. And so that basically is, is the part that most people expect to see when they go to the Hispanic Society. What a lot of people do not know is we have a fabulous collection. I do uh, rare books, which for us is pre-1830. So we have about 20,000 books printed before 1700 and about another 20,000 books printed before 1830. We have about 200,000 manuscripts, documents, letters, etc., etc. And the Modern Library has an additional about 250,000 books in the Modern Library. So I will only talk about the library part because it's too much work to go into the painting, ceramics, uh, prints, photographs, textiles, ironworks, the deck arts that also that form the museum collection. So I will stick uh, just to the uh, examples from, from the library department. So here we have a portrait uh, by Lopez Mesquita of, of Arthur Milton Huntington, the founder of the Hispanic Society. This one was painted in, in 1930. If you look closely, you will see that of all the objects he could have been painted, holding or with is holding a book because Arthur Huntington at his core was a bibliophile, was a book collector. That was his great passion. I don't want to say all the rest was added, but his mm -hmm. true passion was books. So in the next image we can see, uh, well, first of all, he, he formed, the idea, formed the idea of forming a museum at age 12 after a, uh, a visit to the Louvre Museum and he was astounded by it and he says in what remains of his diaries, a museum will, should be a fabulous, a wonderful place to live in. So at that age, he already had the idea of forming a museum. It helps if your parents are multimillionaires. And so that <laughs> helped him in the creation of, uh, of, of the museum. He started to work. He never went to university. He basically was self-taught and hired a, a, a tutor from, from uh, Yale University, William Knapp. And so he set off with the idea of forming this museum. And he set off here. We see him on his first book buying trip in 1892 in Spain. So it doesn't look a book buying trip, uh, but it was. And also what he's doing here is following the Camino del Cid, okay? El Cid, the famous hero of epic poetry, of Spanish history and of uh, epic poetry, 11th century. So Huntington thought that everybody, and this is a, something applied for his curators, should know Spain inside out. So he himself undertook uh, traveling the Camino del Cid while uh, as you can see, in the, uh, well, he had a car. This is the photographic equipment is in the, is in the cart. Uh, the next image is probably one of the more famous things we have. It's a 1526 map of the world by Juan Vespucci, uh, the, the nephew of Amerigo Vespucci, who was a piloto mayor of, uh, of Charles V in, in Spain. And it's, it's probably not used for navigational purposes because it's too big, basically too big and too ornate, but it is the largest, the largest map of its kind in, uh, in existence. And it's just a, the best example we have of, of, the, of the manuscript maps that are held by the Hispanic Society. We have about 40 manuscript maps, obviously of, of varying size and detail and quality. But this one is exceptional because, as you can see, uh, by 1526, they already had documented more or less the outline of South America. The west coast of this country, you can see, still is a bit vague, uh, to the vague point that they didn't even bother putting a coastline on. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so this is this good representation of the charts. The next. Uh, uh, probably again. Uh, the problem is hitting all the treasures is that people expect to see the treasures when they come to the society and then you're told, sorry, they're too fragile to show to the public. But anyway, the first one, the next one is, should be uh, known by all. It's the first, first edition of Don Quixote de la Mancha. Uh, this is the, the, for those that know books, it's the first edition, first state, so it was reprinted three times in 1605. This is the first, first edition, first state of it, the absolute first edition. We have the other states as well and we probably have, outside of the British, uh, library and uh, Biblioteca Nacional de Madrid. We probably have the largest collection of Cervantes related material in the world. The next one is uh, illuminated manuscript. Uh, so people, when they talk about medieval manuscripts, this is basically what, what, they, what they hope to see or what they think they're going to see. And, and unfortunately, only in one case out of what, 
thousand, is this actually what they see? What they usually see is a, uh, uh, the, the proverbial spider crawling across the page, you know, in ink. But this one is important because this is the, this is uh, the Libro de Aniversarios and, and Memorias de, of, a, of a monastery from outside uh, the city of Burgos, San Pedro de Cardenia. And it is famous because it was the first resting, first resting and burial place of El Cid uh, and his wife. So there is a page in it which says that El Cid is buried on the altar at this cathedral. Okay, this one, oh, we jumped on. Okay, that's fine. Uh, the next one actually is a, is a good document too, and it's an example of more or less the quality of what most of our of most of our uh, manuscripts are like. This is this is a what's called a consulta, basically what we would call talking points, I suppose, in modern, uh, by the by the vice chancellor of, of Philip II, the King of Spain. And you can see that the scroll on the left-hand side, it's Philip II's own handwriting. So he was notorious for taking an interest in every aspect of his, of his buildings, his, his reign, etc. Uh, and so he would annotate everything. So, so who can consult these things? Well, basically anybody can consult these things. The, uh, the library, again, it's free, open access to the public. The only thing uh, that we ask at currently is you make an appointment. Uh, and with the proviso that is about 90% of the, of the material is available for consultation. Thanks. And Ricky Riccardi, what's at the Louis Armstrong House Museum? Well, you know, based on the murmur that went through the room during my introduction, I'm going to use my time to talk about winning the Grammy. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so it's April 3rd, 2022, Las Vegas, Nevada. The category was liner notes. It's an actual category. No. <laughs> um, this we're in Brooklyn, hip room. How many people have been to the Louis Armstrong House Museum? Uh, yeah, it could be better. Okay. I won't shame the room. Uh, in you can Manhattan. sing for us, too, if you want. <laughs> I take requests. Um, yeah, no, when, I, when I ask that question in, in Manhattan, it's usually far fewer, because getting to Queens from Manhattan is like going to Siberia. But the Louis Armstrong House Museum, we've been around now for 20 years. It's the house where Louis Armstrong uh, lived for almost the last 30 years of his life. We don't have time to do a full Louis Armstrong 101, but you know, um, to me, he's jazz's greatest, greatest genius. You probably know what a wonderful world or the duets with Ella Fitzgerald. By the 1920s, he's the only figure you could find who completely changes the way people play the music on their instruments with his trumpet playing, completely changes the way people sing. The first black pop star, movie star, breaking down barriers, first African-American jazz musician to host a sponsored radio show to publish an autobiography. And uh, where does he choose to live uh, in the working class neighborhood of Corona? Uh, actually, he didn't choose it. Let's give credit where it's due. Uh, his fourth wife, which is a subject for a whole different panel, uh, his fourth wife, Lucille uh, Wilson Armstrong, she was a cotton club dancer. They married in October, October 12, 1942. Their honeymoon was six straight months of one-nighters, living out of a suitcase, different city every night. Lucille said, this is not what I signed up for. So she had spent her childhood in Corona. She found out the house at 3456, easy to remember, 3456 107th Street was for sale. She purchased it, put her name on it, put the down payment, and did not tell Louis Armstrong. <laughs> so he was on tour. When he comes back from the tour, she goes, I got a surprise for you. I bought a house. And uh, once he took one look at the house, because he had grown up the way he did in New Orleans, poverty doesn't even cover it, and he had been living out of hotel rooms and suitcases for years. Uh, this is kind of a typical Archie Bunker type house. Um, I think we have, yeah, oh, we'll, we'll get into the Archie Cave, we'll get, we'll get there. Uh, but once he moved in, you saw the picture with the kids up there, I mean, that was it. Uh, the neighborhood was real people, they didn't treat him like a celebrity or anything like that. And so uh, from 1943, he passed away at the house in 1971. Lucille, her entire widow widowhood was dedicated to Lewis's legacy. She died, sadly, in 1983. And then in 1987, Queens College made a deal with the Armstrong Foundation, with the Department of Cultural Affairs, to turn the Lewis Armstrong House Museum into a museum. <laughs> well, it wasn't a museum yet, the Lewis Armstrong House into a museum. Step one, though, was the archives. And so inside the house, unbeknownst to even his deepest fans, Louis Armstrong was an archivist. He uh, started making scrapbooks as early as 1926. He saved every record, every clipping that mentioned his name. Uh, he saved books. He saved all the sheet music. We have his entire big band library, uh, objects, ephemera, uh, you name it, he saved it. But uh, some of my favorite things, probably the crown jewels, you'll see right there, are these tape boxes. So. Um, 
the, the previous slide, Lewis was sitting in his den. If anybody noticed the Mets hat on, <laughs> uh, I guess saw the Mets hats walk in. It's all right. We got, we got something for the home team. But Lewis lived in that den, and he would make these reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And um, when he was done making the tapes, he would put collages on them. So you see, those are actually three collages that Lewis Armstrong himself designed. Uh, the subject matter for about 95% of the collages is Lewis Armstrong. <laughs> uh, and so this is not some kind of ego maniacal thing, but the question comes up all the time, why did he do this? Why did he make 700 reel-to-reel -reel tapes and 85 scrapbooks and all this stuff where he's just charting his life? Uh, we have the answer on a tape. Um, I did not bring the audio, but it's probably our most requested tape where Lewis and Lucille get into an argument, vicious argument, like 3 o'clock in the morning. They're both feeling no pain. Lucille does not know he's tape recording it. When she realizes uh, he is, she calls him out on it, and I, we have children present, I will not tell you what she says to him, but let's just say she says, erase that tape, turn that tape recorder off, and he says, no, it's for posterity. And to me, those two words are why we have an archive, it's why we have the Louis Armstrong House Museum. He was aware, he was very self-aware of his importance. He used to give money away left and right. He'd walk down the street giving money away and his manager would call him up and say, what are you doing? You're gonna go broke, you're gonna give your money away. And Lewis would say, what do I need money for? They're gonna write about me in the history books one day. And so he knew it and there was a lot of stuff written about him that was wrong, that was mean, he was a clown, he was a commercial, Uncle Tom, all this stuff haunted him in his life. And so at some point he realized, wait a minute, if I'm in control of my own story, one day, historians, researchers, scholars, when they want to learn about me, they can come to my stuff. They don't have to read any of these other books. And so he makes these tapes and uh, makes these collages. He catalogs them. That's one of his catalog pages. Every reel of tape he made, he would annotate with the contents of the reel. He would number the reel. At the bottom, you see his handwriting. It says S-A-L-L, -L, Saul. That's all. That's not really a library term, but it works for him. Um, <laughs> And I just have to pivot real quick just to give you like how these secrets of the stacks work. So when I am on the clock for the Lewis Armstrong House Museum in charge of the archives, I'm very ethical, I am on the clock, I am representing the Armstrong House. As soon as I go off the clock, all hell breaks loose because I've written two books about Armstrong. I teach Armstrong courses. I got a third Armstrong book coming out next year. And early on, when I first started the job, I was still working on my book um, about Lewis's later years. And I came across one of these handwritten pages and it said, letter to Joe Glazer, 1954. And Joe Glazer was Lewis's manager. I said, what is that? And I found the, the um, page, I found the tape. I had listened to the tape, which hadn't been listened to in 50 years. And it gave me stories that I could not have even dreamed of. And I felt like Lewis Armstrong you know, kind of guided me. And so by him being an archivist, by being so thorough, it's helped me as a researcher, but it helps all of our researchers to this day. So about this day, to the left is the Louis Armstrong House Museum. Uh, that's been open since October 2003. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary. But on the right, has anybody been to the Louis Armstrong Center yet? Oh, okay, we got a couple of diehards, that's great. Uh, this is a building that's literally been 25 years in the making. It was an empty lot across the street. We purchased the lot in 1998 with help from the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation. And it, you know, I was hired in 2009 and told this building would open in 2011. That's all you need to know. It opened in July of 2023. But this is it now. Uh, when, you, when you visit the Louis Armstrong House Museum, you start in the Louis Armstrong Center. There's a state-of-the-art exhibit that was curated by Jason Moran. There's an interactive touch table. Um, we have a performance venue, an 85-seat performance venue, where we, you know, we've been having concerts and stuff like that. And the archives are on the second floor. That picture was actually taken on Thursday because stuff is still coming in. Louis Armstrong's collection is the core. It's what we base everything off of, but anything related to Louis, we still have to take in. So we have 12 separate research collections. It's the largest collection uh, for any jazz musician ever uh, on the planet. And then we have his house, which is a national historic landmark and everything. Archives are still open by appointment only, but I should mention in 2016, we got a $2.7 million grant from Robert F. Smith um, Fund to Foundation to digitize the entire archive. So we welcome you to come out to Corona, make an appointment with me, and, and you can roll up your sleeves and see the stuff, but it's also online. Our website's lewisarmstronghouse.org, or you can go to collections.lewisarmstronghouse.org and literally listen to the tapes, look at the scrapbook pages. It's all there for posterity. So that's, that's in a nutshell, the Louis Armstrong House Museum. <laughs> I'd like to ask each of you something that uh, Ricky raised. 
Uh, you've got tons of stuff, thousands of artifacts, documents. When is enough enough? Uh, <laughs> or when do you have so much stuff that you think you've kind of collected everything? Uh, or there's nothing left out there? Well, I think my fellow uh, <laughs> archivists and librarians here will agree that there, there is no such thing as, as, as enough. <laughs> He, obviously, there are limitations because we have space constraints and, and resources that, you know, to, to make sure that we care properly for these, uh, for these materials, but... And enough money to acquire them. Right, yes. And also, you know, in terms of, uh, for, for subjects such as plant science and, and gardening and architect, those are, uh, this is a field that's constantly changing, especially when you think about the impact of climate change. So for example, in our archives, we, uh, we have photographs, uh, very, very old photographs of plants that are now completely extinct that don't exist anymore. And so we're documenting kind of the changes that are happening in the natural world, but also the, the interest. There was a significant uh, increase in uh, uh, plant ownership during the pandemic, so kind of documenting that increased interest. And so the, the world, especially in terms of natural sciences, is always changing. And it's our job as librarians and archivists to not only look backwards, but to continue to document what's currently happening and thinking about the future of, of this area. And so that's happening at our library, that's happening uh, in the garden. So you have to have a strategy around how you collect and an and, and understanding of the resources and the space that you have, but also always knowing that there's always going to be more things that you want, uh, very necessary things that you feel need to be it, it within your collection. So that's kind of how we look at it at the uh, Mertz Library. John, you said you have a text going back to the 11th century, I guess. How, yeah. You know, how much more is there? Well, there's a lot. Uh, fortunately, I suppose, I have to say, fortunately, countries realized and, and, and enacted patrimony laws to stop, to stop uh, a lot of it leaving the, 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 the country of origin. But there is a lot, there is a lot available in the, in the States. The problem for, for some, somebody like us or an institution like ours is that uh, what we don't have, most other institutions may not have either. So the competition to get a certain printed book of which there's only one known copy or two known copies. It, it used to be how fast can you phone, can you dial? When the, mm -hmm. auction, when the auction catalog or sale catalog could come in, it's how fast you could dial to, <laughs> to, to talk to somebody in London. And we missed out once or twice on, on uh, only known copies. So, no, as, as everyone knows uh, here and hopefully there, uh, no, you can never have enough because there's always something that isn't covered. There is always something covered, and even th there's no collection that's ever complete. We can say we have all the early editions of Don Quixote, but uh, as some people may know, when 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 they were printing the books, it was hand press. They literally would stop the press if they if they saw an error and correct it in the, in the thing, and then keep printing. They didn't go back and correct it in the, the previous mm -hmm. 300 copies they might have printed. So you can have two copies which are supposedly identical, but there's a variation, and that's the sort of thing that, that sort of obsesses people like me. <laughs> and, and Ricky, obviously Louis Armstrong is dead. How much more yeah, news? Let's not get carried away here. <laughs> We're still talking about him. New, well, how much yeah. new stuff can there possibly be? It's insane how much new stuff keeps coming in. Um, I mean, it, the new stuff is old stuff, but stuff that's been squirreled away in, um, you know, basements, attics, I'm always looking for letters and manuscripts. Louis Armstrong carried a typewriter with him at all times and wrote letters almost every day. And I know those letters are out there. And usually it's like a, you know, almost a domino effect. We received the only known studio footage of Louis Armstrong in the studio making a, uh, a record in 1959. We only received that, this is about five, six years ago, because it was in a storage unit <laughs> that had lapsed. Have you ever seen the shows like Storage Wars? Somebody bought the storage unit in Brooklyn, actually, said, there's a Louis Armstrong film. I think you might want to see it. I had to go to, uh, after Coney Island, and I'm watching it. And as soon as the film came on, I'm like, oh my God, I said, this is Satchmo plays King Oliver. But of course, I have to play it cool. So I'm sitting there, <laughs> sweat pouring down. I'm like, ah, I've seen a million things like this. But it was. It was a landmark, and so we, we raised some money, we acquired the footage, and then the AP picked up on it, and they put it everywhere, and then once they picked up on it, 
I get a call from a guy in, um, in Canada who said, hey, my, my pal passed away. He was a pianist in the lounge of the Sands in Las Vegas, and Louis Armstrong played the Sands in August 1957 when they were hanging out. After the gig ended, Louis gave him some reel-to-reel -reel tapes. They have these kind of collages on them, and then he just gave him a tape recorder, and he signed a picture in the tape recorder. And he says, if you want it, you can pay for the shipping, and you can have it. I said, okay. And so that tape recorder is actually on display as part of Jason Moran's exhibit right now. So a lot of it is just about people learning that we exist, and then they say, oh, you know, my grandfather had this. But then there's other things, you know, manuscripts. There's a collection. Lewis had a road doctor, Dr. Alexander Schiff, for the last 15, 20 years of his life. And John mentioned auctions. This came up in a, a swan uh, auction last year. And we had to go to war for it. Um, there, I don't know who else was wanted it as badly as we did, but we, we walked away with it. And uh, it had like a 22-page manuscript that had a 12-page manuscript that we had the other part that began with page 13. And now the other 12 pages came to us 40 years later. So um, that stuff, just it, it just keeps happening. It, there's really no end in sight. I will say, I also get the, the emails. Um, you know, I found my father's... Uh, LP of Hello Dolly. We have 50 of those. So I have learned to say no at, at certain things, but the, the, the monumental discoveries just keep coming in, and I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. We live today in such a virtual world. How important is authenticity? How important is having the actual object, the actual text, not some Xerox copy, not some uh, image that is reproduced. Uh, obviously, that's harder with a plant, but with pictures, <laughs> with text. Uh, how important is the actual authentic object uh, that people want to see, maybe even touch, uh, but see in three dimensions? Well, for, for, I'll go first. For, uh, for us, yes, it's absolutely important. And it's more important than ever because of the digital age, even though with all its advantages, uh, we get we get school groups, we get uh, you know advanced uh, advanced placement groups, we get university groups to come in, and uh, and you have to bear in mind that a lot of students nowadays haven't even touched their own textbook, so the idea that they can we bring out we bring out a book and they can't believe that parchment used to reside on the back of an animal, and that it was a living it was a living thing and it was skinned it was stripped it was prepared and people actually wrote on it and people. Some actually printed on it as well. So that in and of itself, and I usually let them touch a corner, you know, just, uh, some of them won't, some of them don't dare touch a corner because they think it's gonna bite them, I have no idea. But I think that alone justifies having the, the object in front of you. Just that one experience alone. At the Armstrong Archives, I mean, yeah, obviously we always want the original. We can't always afford the original. And so at that point, um, I'm, I'm usually perfectly happy with the content. Like if Louis Armstrong wrote a letter and he says something in that letter that he never said anywhere else, but the person with the letter wants $30,000 for it, keep your $30,000, <laughs> just send me a scan of the letters, I mean, or type it up sometimes. Uh, because we, I mean, we have so much authentic stuff. You know, that's the other thing sometimes I, I have to turn down. People have an autograph that just says Louis Armstrong and you know, they want thousands of dollars. And I say, well, that's very kind, but you know, we have 77-page handwritten manuscripts. You know, I've, I've gotten over autographs. You know? so, um, so authenticity, you know, it's, it's important, but for me, the information is the most important. So if there's a way to get the information about Louis Armstrong or from Louis Armstrong, and there's no other way to get the actual artifacts, um, I'm personally OK with that. Again, you have so many things in your collection, thousands of things, artifacts, texts, pictures. What would you say is the one thing that defines your connect collection if you had to single out one thing? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. <laughs> trumpet. <laughs> we have seven Louis Armstrong trumpets. Um, he left behind five. And then one was part of a, a private collection we acquired, the Jack Brownlee collection. But the seventh one, I'll tell you about real quick. In 1934, Lewis performed in England, and he had an audience with King George V, and King George V uh, presented him a Selmer trumpet, gold-plated, uh, with an inscription uh, that said, Property of Lewis Armstrong. And Lewis accepted it, and he played it for years. You can see in all the publicity photos in the 30s, there's photos where he's posing the horn right next to his, his face. You can see the property of Lewis Armstrong. 
In the early 1940s, he shares a bill with the Charlie Barnett Band and uh, the Charlie Barnett Orchestra. The third trumpeter was a guy named Lyman Bunk. It's far from a household name, as you can imagine. And one day, Bunk is backstage with Lewis, and he goes, man, Pops, that is a beautiful horn. And Lewis goes, oh, do you want it? I'm due for a new one anyway. And Lewis Armstrong <laughs> gives away the King George trumpet. And so it, it becomes Lyman Bunk's prized possession. And then in 1997, Bunk passed away, and he left it. Uh, we have, we're not a museum yet. We were just the archives. But he left it to us in his, um, his will. And so his widow called us up, told us about it, said, you know, I'll, I'll meet you in Queens. But she didn't want to navigate Queens. So she met our director at the 7 train. She got off the subway. <laughs> she handed him the King George trumpet in a brown paper bag, said, here it is. Got back on the subway, went home. And uh, we, you know, we've had the horn since 1997, but we had it restored in April, and uh, it's the, you know, again, we have seven of them, but when it comes to the Louis Armstrong Center, the one that Jason chose to be on display is the King George trumpet. So somehow it's back in Queens where it always belonged. John, how about you? Yeah. Uh, it would be impossible to, to choose just one object, so I would say that uh, in 1902, Huntington bought what was then considered the, the most important collection of, of, of Spanish literature. Uh, books uh, uh, in, in private hands in Spain actually it was offered to him by the, by the owner, which is the, the Marques Jerez de los Caballeros. So uh, it was for hunting and it contained about 10,000 books and manuscripts and basically it forms a backbone of the, a backbone of the, uh, of the collection really. It was important to hunting him because in, in, the, in the book uh, trip that I mentioned about 1898, he actually went and saw uh, Jerez and sat, sat in, his, uh, in his study and marveled at all the books and he says once again in one of his letters or whatever, it was as if every hero of uh, Spanish uh, chivalrous novels was floating around in the, in the room and there was lovely artwork but it was the books, the books he says is what illuminated the, the room and he gave up on the idea of purchasing it because he thought uh, he'd never sell it and then suddenly four years later uh, Jerez offers him the collection saying I offer it to you because A, I know you're the only one with the money, <laughs> and B, I know you will not sell any volume from this collection. You will keep it whole and hunting to this day. It is in its entirety in the Hispanic Society of Hawaii. There we go. Rhonda, I know yeah. you've only been there a couple yeah. of months, and you are a curator <laughs> rather than a botanist, but what do you think so far? That's a really hard question for the garden, but I guess one way, because you could look at it in, in a number of different ways, but I think what I would have to say are the, the archival papers of Elizabeth and Nathaniel Britton, who are the founders of the New York Botanical Garden, and this was their vision, you know, to have this garden and to have this library and to have this herbarium. So I think if you really want to understand the vision, the mission, the history of the garden, that's where you would start. But there are so many just wonderful, wonderful, um, things that I'm learning about in the garden. So it's really hard, and kind of just to go back to your question of authenticity, of course, you know, as they were saying, you, it's really important to, to, to have digital images of things because that's a wonderful way to provide access. But as people who are here who are book lovers and understanding the, 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 the construction, the history of paper, to have that, and to have original herbarium specimens, uh, people who just, decided to take their time and press plants and give them to the garden to be able to experience those things firsthand are, are, are really wonderful. So it's really hard to, to think about just one thing that identify, that defines the Merch Library, but that's what I would go with. We have a couple of minutes for questions if anyone has them. Yes, over there, could you come up to the microphone just so everybody can hear you? Thank you, this has been so fascinating. Um, I'm sure you get a lot of visitors, uh, writers and historians. Have there been any notable uh, books or works that have been created based on research from your various collections? <laughs> Could Mine. everybody hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Any books other than Ricky's? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I know, not that he did anything with it, but Tony Bennett actually came up to us and looked at a, a copy of Don Quixote's first part. Uh, but it, it didn't, I didn't, uh, I don't think we just any songs uh, based on that experience. Uh, the only ones come to mind and not in my time were James Missioner, obviously when he was working on his uh, Iberia. Uh, what's the Netanyahu's father, who was a historian of uh, the Inquisition, worked extensively in the library when he wrote his history of the, of the Inquisition. Uh, I can't think of other people. 
And Ricky, any besides you? Yeah, no, I, I, will, I, I will say there are others besides me. <laughs> um, Armstrong scholarship changed with the access to the archives. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you briefly, and Louis Armstrong died in 1971. It was front page news, but to a lot of people, it was the guy in the Ed Sullivan show, Hello Dolly. And there was also a lot of obituaries at the time uh, that kind of like lamented his life. Like, yeah, we remember Lewis as this kind of lovable guy, but when he was young, oh boy, he was a genius and he kind of sold out and gave it all up to just be this kind of clown and we should learn from Lewis Armstrong and not do this again. And then a book came out in the early 80s, which I will not call the name of, uh, that's probably the most mean-spirited jazz book ever written. The whole thing just psychoanalyzes Armstrong, and his hunger for applause, and you know, why he chose these decisions, and all this kind of stuff. And then Lucille died in 1983, not related to the release of that book, <laughs> I don't think. But um, after Queens College made the deal with the archives, before it was even brought to the archives, Gary Giddens was the first person who was hired to go to the Armstrong house in Corona, and the stuff was still in like desks in, in Louis Armstrong's house. And he wrote a book called Satchmo that came out in 1988. And that's when you start seeing Armstrong's scholarship change. And then by the 90s, Ken Burns, the, the jazz documentary, yeah, him and his team were at the Armstrong archives the entire time. Terry Teachout's book, Pops, um, my three books. And then last year, there was a documentary on Apple TV called Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues. They, that entire documentary was made with the help of our archives. And so where you see Armstrong, where he is now in the public culture, where you see these documentaries, these books, the new scholarship, the new Armstrong Center, it is 100%, I really believe this, because Louis Armstrong was allowed to speak for himself, was allowed to voice these opinions, the stuff that he set in motion in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, didn't, we didn't get to until the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and we're still learning today. And so I've said this a million times, but we're still at the beginning of the Armstrong Renaissance. I think 50 years from now, when they say, who are the greats? It's gonna be Shakespeare, it's gonna be Mozart, it's gonna be Louis Armstrong. No one will question it. So there'll be more books, more works, and uh, I'm just happy to be in the middle of it. And there are always uh, scientists, novelists, artists who are using our archives and using our library. A novel recently came out called The Weeds, uh, and, and a lot of, uh, uh, the, and the author did a lot of research at the Mertz Library. There's a book coming out on Darwin uh, next month, uh, which was written by, uh, partially written by Bobby Angel, who is a very well-known botanical artist and who used a lot of our, uh, the Darwin collection that we have. And then we also have the works by the scientists who work with us in the International Plant Science Center. One of our uh, scientists, Michael Balick, is one of the world's uh, foremost expert on poisonous plants and has written probably one of the most popular books on poisonous plants that uh, we are honored to have uh, in our library. So there's always wonderful research uh, being done, whether it's fiction, children's books, science, all types of things. And most of them are on sale at the New York Botanical Garden Bookstore. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am, yes. If you could lower that microphone. Or raise oldest? you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What's one of the oldest books at the Brooklyn Botanical Library? The oldest book? Yes, the oldest book at the New York Botanical Garden Library um, is one of the images that I showed earlier, which is called Circa Sands, and it's from 1190. And it was written by monks uh, in Salerno who were kind of attempting their first uh, 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 writings on Western uh, medicines and pharmacy. And so we have quite a few really, really old books like that that are just great. Some of them have beautiful uh, images, uh, beautiful uh, ink dye wood cuttings. And so we have many books that go back to um, uh, over nine centuries. Let's take one more question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for advocating for your collections. It was great to hear I'm in conservation, so this week we had a deluge. Um, can you talk a little bit about the reality of caring physically for your collections? You don't have to, you know, <laughs> divulge if anything got wet, but um, what happens <laughs> if something, if you have an emergency, you know, physically with your objects, what do you do, who do you call? And also, if there's time, like, what's on your wish list? In Good that, question. In that sense. Thanks. 
Well, at uh, the Merch Library, we have a phenomenal conservation staff who are uh, experts in, uh, in, in working with paper. And so they are always doing wonderful works to take care of our, our collections. And working with them, we do have an emergency plan uh, in terms of any type of uh, building emergencies, natural disasters, including kind of what was happening on Friday, right? <laughs> so, and, and so they're always really careful about going around to each part of the building, making sure that our collections are safe, looking at temperature, looking at humidity levels. Um, we have an emergency plan that includes every part of the garden, security, um, operations, uh, and they've been working with other institutions to understand how they work in, uh, in protecting their collections. And of course, we have all the standard protections. When we get donations, we freeze, and we quarantine, and we do all the proper conservation work and make sure that they are housed and they're secure. So that's just kind of a very short uh, answer. But you know, they, if, if that's something that you are interested in learning more about how we do it, we welcome you to visit us and to also visit our conservation lab. John? Uh, all, of, all of what Ms. Rhonda just said. Uh, <laughs> we're fortunate in the sense that uh, the vault where the rare book collection is kept is sort of isolated in the middle of our building. It's not ground floor, it's not top floor, and it's, uh, it's, uh, the, it's, uh, the building itself is a seal and concrete uh, construction, so that works. Uh, it's air conditioned. We have a, we have a, a smaller conservation lab. There is uh, one of the projects for the renovation and for the expansion of the society is a fully formed uh, conservation lab, but basically everything Rhonda said is what we would do as well. So I presume Ricky has other problems? Uh, I have, yeah, <laughs> exactly. We don't have a conservation lab. <laughs> um, but we've been, we've been fortunate. Um, I mean, I've been there 14 years, really no disasters on, on my end. Except you could say, you know, disasters caused by time. I, mean, I showed those collages. Louis Armstrong used scotch tape for those collages. So um, when he was alive, I'm sure they looked great. But uh, up to a few years ago, there were, were certain collages I would pull off the shelves and the scotch tape would just start flaking off. So last year, we were fortunate. We did get a Save America's Treasures grant, uh, which had enough money for us to conserve 77 collages, $200,000. Um, we would like more of those grants and conserve more because the, the, we use the Northeast Document Conservation Center and they did an incredible job. Uh, most of the collages on display in the Armstrong Center are the recently conserved boxes. They are totally restored, but we need more funds and need to do it for more, more, um, you know, more boxes. And the same thing with some of the scrapbooks too. During the pandemic, we had uh, many scrapbooks conserved. The same thing, 1920s newspapers. They were flaking off every time you opened the booklet, but um, they're in better shape now. I should also mention, in addition to the archives, we do have a house that was built in 1910. And so the house, that's a whole other set of, of problems, uh, not related to the stacks, but um, you know, during the pandemic, we had water damage. We had to replace sheetrock. We had to reupholster couches. We had to do a lot of stuff, and we did have a few leaks on Friday, too. So that's, um, that's not what that's not part of my job, but it is, it's very important because everything in that house, every painting, every stick of furniture, it's considered a museum object. So uh, these are the things that we have. Grant season is coming up, and actually I just had, I just had a meeting with my, our director last week, like, you know, all right, here are the house grants, here are the archives grants, let's go for it. So more grants to come. <laughs>